uh, all classical space got this uh, structure can be encoded in a symmetry group. Um, and you can define the uh, symmetry group that all classical space times have in common, even though they may, they may differ on additional symmetries. Um, and this group is uh, generated by vector fields that they annihilate the uh, spatial and metrics. metrics. <coughs> so, uh, one example of a classical space time is neo Newtonian space time, which is uh, spatial temporally flat. Um, and then symmetry group is the Galilei group, which is generated by vector fields that we annihilate the uh, spatial and temporal metrics and the connection associated with the flat uh, curvatures. <coughs> another example of the classical space time is Maxwellian space time, uh, characterized by the vanishing of uh, the rotational part of the, of the curvature. Uh, and that symmetry group is uh, given by the Maxwell group, which is generated by vector fields that they annihilate the spatial and temporal metrics and uh, the rotational part of the connection. <coughs> uh, so again, um, different classical space times have the same metrical structure, but different curvature, um, and all are characterized by absolute spatial and temporal metrics. Um, and corresponding to different types of classical space times, there can be different types of uh, non relativistic quantum field theories, um, and some in flat you know, Newtonian space time, and others in uh, curved classical space time. Uh, so, I'd now like to consider how the spatial temporal distinction between relativistic quantum field theories and non relativistic quantum field theories impacts the current debate in the philosophy of quantum field theory um, and with debate over particle interpretations. So, According to a received view, in order to admit a particle interpretation, the quantum field theory must satisfy uh, the following two conditions. Uh, uh, first, the quantum field theory must admit a Fox space formulation in which local number operators appear uh, that can be interpreted as acting on the state of the system associated with the bound region of space time and returning the number of particles of that region. And secondly, the quantum field theory must admit a unique box space formulation in which a total number operator appears that can be interpreted as acting on the state of the system and returning the total number of particles in that state. Uh, so condition A is supposed to encode the essential particle characteristic of localizability. Uh, for a system of particles distributed over various regions of space, an adequate theory must be able to identify the number of particles located in each region. And condition B is supposed to include the essential particle characteristic of countability. Uh, for a system of particles distributed over various regions of space, an adequate theory must be able to identify a unique value of the total number of uh, particles uh, counted over all regions. <coughs> so it's fairly simple to demonstrate that conditions A and B fail in relativistic quantum field theories. Um, so first consider condition B of a unique total number operator. Um, so in general, condition B faces the problem of privilege, uh, namely, relativistic quantum field theories admit unitarily an equivalent Fox space formulation, uh, Fox space representations of their canonical commutation relations. Um, the consequence of the failure of the Stone von Neumann theorem for relativistic theories with infinite degrees of freedom. Um, so to the extent that unitary equivalence is necessary for physical equivalence, uh, this suggests that any given relativistic quantum field theory admits many different ways uh, to parse particle talk. One for every unitary equivalence, unitary equivalence class of Fox space representations and their attendant total number operator. Um, well, this problem of privilege may appear to be solved in Minkowski space time by appeal to the time like isometry subgroup of the Poincare group. Um, so intuitively, uh, time-like symmetries of Minkowski space-time provide one with a way to split the frequencies of uh, uh, solutions to relativistic field equations. And this allows the construction of a one-particle state, uh, state space on which a Fox space representation can be built. Um, and Kay showed that this method of constructing a Fox space representation is unique up to unitary equivalence. <coughs> uh, but uh, the Unruh effect um, is in one guise uh, suggests, at least to some authors, uh, that relativistic quantum field theories in Minkowski space-time do not avoid the problem of privilege. Uh, 
So when the, when the time-like isometry subgroup of the point gray group is restricted to a portion of Minkowski space-time, um, it's called the right Rindler, right Rindler wedge. Uh, it emits two distinct time-like killing vector fields, you know, one associated with inertial frames and the other with accelerated frames. Um, and this, uh, this gives rise to two unitarily equivalent Fox space representations, um, the standard Minkowski representation and the Rindler representation. And this has suggested to some authors that inertial and accelerating observers uh, will disagree over the particle content of a relative Stefan field theory in Minkowski space time. Um, <clears throat> but to uh, other authors, uh, the fact that the right Rindler wedge is extendable, the fact that it can, it can be embedded in, in, a, in a, a larger space time, uh, makes it physically inadmissible as an arena in which to define a relative Stefan field theory. Uh, so to these authors, the Unruh effect is not a problem uh, per se for condition B. Uh, but in any event, uh, Hogg's theorem uh, blocks condition B for uh, realistic, uh, in other words, interactive relativistic quantum field theories. So uh, under a reasonable assumption, Hogg's theorem entails that uh, representations of the canonical commutation relations for both a uh, non-interactive and an interactive relativistic quantum field theory cannot be constructed so that they are unitarily equivalent at the same time. <clears throat> um, so provided, again, that unitary equivalence is a necessary condition for physical equivalence, uh, this suggests that an interactive relativistic quantum field theory cannot be interpreted as consisting of a system of initially uh, uh, non-interacting particles uh, that interact over, over a finite period of time and then separate into uh, uh, back into non-interactive states, um, a typical scenario for scattered experiments. Um, but more precisely, Hogg's theorem suggests that a Fox space representation of the canonical commutation relations of a non-interactive relativistic quantum field theory cannot be used to represent particle states in an interactive relativistic quantum field theory. <clears throat> um, well, one might then wonder if particle states might be represented more directly in an interactive relativistic quantum field theory by constructing an explicit Fox space representation of its canonical commutation relations, um, as opposed to piggybacking on non interactive representations. Um, however, it's unclear if such a Fox space representation of the canonical commutation relations for an interactive uh, relativistic quantum field theory can be constructed. Um, so, uh, I conclude, mm -hmm. but what normally concludes that condition B fails in relativistic quantum field theories. Because that's the conclusion. Um, so, condition A, uh, the requirement of uh, 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 local number operators. Um, condition A is spoiled in relativistic quantum field theories in the following way. Well, first, consider uh, the, the separability cor corollary um, found in Streeter and White Whiteman. So, let uh, A be a local algebra of operators associated with the bounded region of space time. If the uh, following three conditions are satisfied, <clears throat> uh, the vacuum state is cyclic for A, what, what might be called local simplicity. <clears throat> um, the the space-time region has non-trivial causal complement um, and relativistic local commutativity holds, uh, then the vacuum state is separated uh, for the local algebra. Uh, in other words, uh, any operator in the algebra, for any operator in the algebra, if it, if it annihilates the vacuum, then it's like local zero. Um, so, the reich schlieder theorem secures condition 1 for Minkowski spacetime, uh, the structure of Minkowski spacetime uh, secures condition 2, um, and relativistic quantum field theories uh, satisfy uh, relativistic local condition 3. <coughs> uh, thus, the vacuum state of a relativistic quantum field theory in Minkowski spacetime is separated. Um, now, uh, the annihilation operators that appear in Fox space formulations of quantum field theories by definition annihilate the vacuum um, and act non-trivially on other states. Uh, so, separability of the vacuum entails that there can be uh, no annihilation operator associated with the bounded region of Minkowski spacetime. Uh, thus, there can be no number operator associated with such a region, and that number operators are defined in terms of annihilation operators. Um, Thus, uh, local number operators in the sense of condition A cannot exist for relativistic quantum field theories in the Minkowski space. 
Um, so much for Minkowski space time, uh, but uh, what about Lorentzian space times in general? The question now arises as to uh, to what extent does the separability corollary hold for relative quantum filters in Lorentzian space time? Well, extensions of the reach leader theorem have been proven for relativistic quantum field theories in uh, ultra-static and stationary Lorentzian space times. Um, one of these authors states the following, uh, Strohmeyer. As soon as, a classical, uh, as soon as a classical field satisfies a certain hyperbolic partial differential equation, a state of the field algebra of the quantized theory, which is a ground or human state with respect to group of time translations, has the reach leader property. Uh, uh, what I call local simplicity. <coughs> uh, well, this might suggest that uh, local simplicity of the vacuum is a generic feature of relativistic quantum field theories in globally hyperbolic Lorentzian space times. Uh, but uh, if this is right, then uh, local simplicity is not a generic feature of relativistic quantum field theories in Lorentzian space times. Uh, Fuster and Higuchi demonstrated that uh, global, hyperbolicity, global hyperbolicity is not a necessary condition for the existence of the relative quantum field theory or place in space time. Um, I think the idea here is uh, even uh, for any point in a relativistic, uh, for any point in the Lorentzian space time, you can define a neighborhood of that point that is that is globally hyperbolic and, and uh, associate a local algebra of operators with that neighborhood. And then the idea is to uh, in a group, uh, piece together uh, the local algebras associated with these globally hyperbolic neighborhoods of points into a global algebra. And in some cases, uh, the global algebra has the, has the correct uh, properties that, uh, that define the local system. <coughs> um, now, note also that in Strohmeyer's comment, the reference to be in a ground or KMS state with respect to the group of time translations uh, is a reference to the state being analytic and the energy. Um, and such analyticity might be identified as a necessary condition for local simplicity. Uh, however, um, as I'll discuss in just a moment, for local algebras associated, uh, local algebras defined on spatial regions of classical space times, local simplicity fails, um, even though, uh, assumedly, the vacuum state is analytic in the appropriate sense. Um, thus, it appears that analyticity isn't sufficient for local simplicity either. Um, so, in general, local simplicity uh, is not a generic feature of analytic states either. Um, let me move on to uh, non relativistic quantum field theories. Um, now, non relativistic quantum field theories, both free and interact in uh, conditions A and B of the received view, uh, are satisfied. Um, and, um, I'm going to try to argue that this is due to the presence of an absolute temporal metric in classical space times. <clears throat> so, consider condition A first. Um, well, any chance of extending the separability corollary to non relativistic quantum field theories uh, first requires replacing the requirement of relativistic local communitivity uh, with its non relativistic analog. Uh, non relativistic local community <coughs> requires that uh, field quantities associated with space time regions with zero temporal and non zero spatial separation commute. Uh, and this requires keeping track of the distinction between local algebras defined on spatial temporal regions of space time and those defined on spatial regions. Um, now, for uh, for spatio-temporal local algebras associated with non-relativistic quantum field theories, a uh, report uh, demonstrated local simplicity of the vacuum. Uh, but uh, the absolute temporal structure of classical space times entails that the causal complement of a spatio-temporal region of a classical space time is trivial. Um, so uh, vacuum separability fails uh, in this case. Um, and for spatial local algebras associated with non relativistic quantum field theories, uh, local simplicity of the vacuum does not hold. Uh, so uh, uh, vacuum separability fails in this case too. Um, now, why does local simplicity fail for local algebras associated with spatial regions of classical space time? <coughs> uh, 
Well, here, here's my conjecture. Uh, this, is, this is based uh, on remarks made by Saunders and Streeter. Uh, so, let's suppose uh, phi is a positive frequency solution for well posed uh, partial differential equation. Um, and it turns out that uh, phi is the boundary value of a holomorphic function uh, defined on a suitable extension of the real number line. Uh, now, let S be an open spatial region of space time. Um, if phi vanishes on S, then it vanishes in the domain of dependence of S. Um, now, consider the case of a hyperbolic partial differential equation in a Lorentzian space time. Uh, the domain of dependence of S will in general have non zero temporal extent. Um, you can think of this as a result of the prohibition on indefinitely large propagation speeds in the space time. Um, so if phi vanishes on S, it vanishes on an open, in an open set in time, and the edge of the wedge theorem then entails that it vanishes everywhere. Uh, so if phi is non zero somewhere, it cannot vanish on S. Um, and this property of a solution to a partial differential equation is what Siegel and Goodman referred to as the anti-locality uh, on spatial regions of the uh, differential operator associated with the, uh, the PPE. Um, and Siegel and Goodman uh, demonstrated that such anti-locality entails the vacuum state uh, of a relativistic quantum field theory defined on the space time that's going to be safer. <coughs> Now consider the case of a parabolic PDE in a classical space-time. So due to the absolute temporal metric, the domain of dependence of S will have zero temporal extent. Um, think of this as a result of a lack of a prohibition on indefinitely large propagation speeds in a classical space-time. So if phi vanishes on S, then it need not vanish on an open set in time. Um, and hence phi being uh, non-zero somewhere is consistent with the vanishing on S. So anti-locality for spatial regions fails, um, and assumably uh, local simplicity does too. So to recap, uh, uh, the conjecture here is that the presence of an absolute temporal metric guarantees that the vacuum of a non-relativistic quantum field theory is not locally cyclic for spatial local algebras, um, and thus uh, it's not simple. Um, so we can add uh, condition B in non-relativistic quantum uh, in non-relativistic quantum field theories, there's no problem with privilege. And in particular, the absolute temporal metric of a classical space-time guarantees uh, a unique global time function on the space-time. And this guarantees a unique means to construct a one-particle structure of the classical phase space, um, hence guaranteed a, a unique total number operator. <coughs> um, uh, unitarily inequivalent representations of the canonical commutation relations may still occur if the classical phase space has topological defects, uh, even in systems with finite degrees of freedom um, and assumedly unique local time functions. Uh, but barring such mutants, uh, uh, the point goes through. So, uh, the general moral I draw from, from this part of the talk is the following. Uh, to the extent that conditions A and B require the existence of an absolute temporal metric, they are informed by a non-relativistic concept of time, and thus are inappropriate and informed in interpretations of relativistic quantum field theories. Now, I'd like to uh, now consider a concrete example of a non-relativistic quantum field theory in a curved classical space-time. Um, and to set the stage, I'd first like to review two types of classical Newtonian gravitation theory. Um, it turns out that it's the second type that, uh, um, that admits a quantization. So here's the first type. Uh, this, this type is formulated with the gravitational potential against the backdrop of a fixed classical space time um, and can be represented by models that include. Uh, uh, a differentiable manifold with spatial and temporal metrics, a derivative operator, um, and scalar fields that represent the uh, uh, Newtonian gravita gravitational potential field uh, capital phi and uh, the mass density uh, rho. Do you want the indices up on that each final run? What was the comment? In the final, in the final equation, 
of the H on the right side if you want to present this exact. Yeah. Um, so the metrics and connection define a classical space time and the potential field and uh, mass density are required to satisfy the Poisson equation uh, and the equation of motion. Um, uh, now recall that to fully specify a classical space-time, one has to pick out a particular metric-compatible derivative operator, and this can be done by imposing constraints on the curvature tensor. Um, thus, there can be different versions of this type of Newtonian gravitation theory, uh, dependent on these additional uh, curvature constraints. So, uh, one example uh, might be called Neo-Newtonian uh, Newtonian gravity. <laughs> Uh, this is the standard way that Newtonian gravity is formulated. So this theory describes Newtonian gravity in terms of a potential field and a mass density defined in spatial temporally flat Neo-Newtonian space time. <clears throat> um, now a second example can be had by imposing a boundary condition on Neo-Newtonian uh, gravity that, for that forces the gravitational potential to vanish at spatial infinity. Um, and the result is a co concentration of mass in the center of the universe. Uh, um, and what's been referred to as an island, uh, island universe effect. Um, and finally, a third, uh, time, uh, a third example is obtained by defining the Newtonian gravitational potential and mass density in Maxwellian space. Right. Now, we move on to the second type of classical Newtonian uh, gravitational theory. Uh, and this type subsumes the gravitational potential field into the space-time connection um, and is generally referred to as Newton-Cartan gravity, NCG. Um, so models of NCG eliminate the Newtonian gravitational potential. Um, now, the spatial and temporal metrics and, and a compatible derivative operator still uh, define a classical space-time, but the Poisson equation is now replaced by a generalized Poisson equation, um, and uh, the equation of motion is replaced with the geodesic equation. Um, now, these changes enforce the principle of equivalence in newton cartan gravity. So intuitively, uh, a newton cartan connection uh, can't distinguish between straight inertial trajectories and uh, curved gravitationally accelerated trajectories. Uh, so in this sense, gravity is geometricized. Uh, now, there, there are different ways this geometrization uh, procedure can be carried out dependent on additional constraints one imposes on the curvature tensor to specify a particular class in space. <clears throat> um, so one example might be referred to as uh, weak newton cartan gravity. Um, um, in this example, the additional curvature constraint imposes uh, what's been referred to as a curl-free condition uh, on the curvature tensor. Um, and this is necessary in recovering weak newton cartan gravity as the non-relativistic limit of general relativity. It imposes a, um, a Riemannian symmetry on the curvature tensor that allows, allows you to uh, uh, recover a, a pseudo-Riemannian. Uh, that allows the, uh, sorry, uh, the weak or can, uh, curvature tensor to be recovered uh, in the limit, in the non relativistic limit from a, a pseudo-Riemannian. Uh, 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 cur the curvature tensor is okay. Um, now, this, this uh, curl-free condition is, is also necessary, but not sufficient in recovering the Poisson equation. Um, and if, if you want to fully recover the Poisson equation, um, it suffices to impose um, a boundary condition on weak newton cartan gravity uh, in the form of uh, asymptotic spatial flatness. <coughs> um, now, arguably, this theory is empirically equivalent to the theory of ungeometricized geometricized uh, Newton, Newtonian gravity and Neo-Newtonian space-time with the island universe boundary condition. Um, insofar as both theories uh, have the same spatial temporal and dyna dynamical symmetries uh, appropriate to the um, Now a third type, a third example of newton cartan gravity is what might, what might be called strong newton cartan gravity. Um, here, in addition to the curl free condition, one imposes a rotation standard, the same standard in Maxwellian space-time. Um, and this is also sufficient to recover the Poisson equation. 
And one can argue that this theory is empirically equivalent to the theory of ungeometricized <coughs> gravity of Maxwellian spacetime. Um, given that one under a certain construal of uh, spacetime and dynamical symmetries. Uh, now it's this last example uh, that uh, generates uh, uh, what's been referred to as Newtonian quantum gravity. So uh, Joy Christian, um, in a paper published in 1997, demonstrated that the curvature conditions imposed by strong newton cartan gravity are sufficient to recast the theory as a constrained Hamiltonian system. Um, the reduced phase space consists of variables encoding matter degrees of freedom and variables encoding uh, dynamical degrees of freedom in the strong Newton-Cartan connection. Um, and these latter are, are identified as gravitational degrees of freedom. Uh, uh, the phase space has a non-degenerate non-degenerate symplectic structure and a unique one parameter family of time evolution maps uh, due to the absolute uh, temporal metric. Um, so it admits a unique one particle structure and thus a unique Fox based representation of one of the quantization functions. Um, and so the result is uh, Christian's uh, Newtonian quantum gravity in <coughs> uh, So it takes the form of an interactive Maxwell invariant quantum field theory said in a curved classical spacetime, uh, what might be called uh, strong Newton-Cartan spacetime. Um, now, as a non relativistic quantum field theory, um, it satisfies conditions A and B of the received view. Uh, the received view is notion of particle. <clears throat> and it's, it's interesting to compare it with, uh, with uh, attempts to construct, standard attempts to construct uh, um, Relativistic, relativistic quantum field theories of gravity. So, um, <coughs> its gravitational degrees of freedom are dynamic, um, and this distinguishes it from the program of constructing relativistic quantum field theories in curved Lorentzian space times. Um, and this program uh, attempts to construct relativistic quantum field theories that incorporate gravity by treating gravity classically as a manifestation of space time curvature. Uh, and this is done by um, breaking the dynamical link between space-time and matter, um, uh, given in general relativity. And the curse, Lorentzian space-time in such a theory is absolute in the sense that it has no dynamical degrees of freedom. Um, and it, so in, in Newtonian gravity, Newtonian quantum gravity, on the other hand, uh, strong Newton-Cartan space-time has quantized dynamical degrees of freedom, namely those associated with the, uh, the connection. <coughs> Um, and moreover, uh, again, in, in Newtonian quantum gravity, uh, we don't face the problem of privilege in uh, determining a Fox space representation of the quantification relations. Um, and this is in contrast to the program of relativistic quantum field theories in curved Lorentzian space times. Uh, of course, there isn't even a guarantee that the space time will admit time like isometries in the first case. Um, and one can also compare Newtonian quantum gravity to uh, uh, the program of, of uh, of uh, semi-classical quantum gravity. Uh, the fact that their gravitational degrees of freedom in Newtonian quantum gravity are fully, fully quantized distinguishes it from semi-classical approaches to incorporating gravity into relativistic quantum field theories. Um, semi-classical quantum gravity attempts to in include dynamical degrees of freedom associated with the gravitational field into a relativistic quantum field theory by replacing the stress energy tensor in the Einstein equation uh, with its expectation value with respect to quantized matter fields. Um, so in semi-classical quantum gravity, one treats gravity classically, the metric is quantized, uh, but one quantizes the matter fields. <coughs> well, uh, Newtonian quantum gravity has suggested to Christian a novel route to formulate in a fully relativistic theory of gravity, uh, namely relativizing a non-relativistic quantum uh, a non-relativistic theory of quantum gravity. Uh, so in the remainder of my talk, I'd like to uh, review this strategy and uh, expand on Christian's picture of interferential relations associated with it. Uh, so this part of the talk is a bit more uh, speculative. So uh, to begin, um, Christian views a Newtonian quantum gravity as a means to fill a void in what he refers to as uh, the great dimensional monolith of physics. <laughs> um, it's a diagrammatic representation of the relations between fundamental theories of physics. 
Um, so it takes the form of a Q with axes representing uh, the Newtonian gravitational constant P, Fox uh, constant HR, and the inverse uh, speed of light. And the vertices that are meant to represent uh, classical mechanics, special relativity. Uh, this is in uh, Christian's terminology. Like, uh, Galilean variant quantum mechanics, relativistic quantum field theory. Uh, and the top, and gravity is turned on. Newtonian, uh, Newton for tan gravity, general relativity, Newtonian quantum gravity, and the elusive, fully relativistic quantum gravity. <coughs> Where's Galilean uh, quantum field theory? Where's Galilean quantum field theory? It's it's not a, it's not there. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the modifications. <laughs> um, this is a Christian's diagram is, is a modification of a of a diagram of, that appeared in a, a couple of articles by Roger Penrose. Um, Penrose's diagram is a whatever term. <laughs> Can't the PQM um, um, vertex include quantum field theory too? No? So, so why 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 does why does that diagram of post time create freedom? That's that's one of my criticisms. <laughs> I mean, why can't why can't I simply write PQM key on that vertex? Well, no, I, I'd like to. Uh, to uh, investigate some of the, 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 the some of the some of the limited relations here, and attempt to see how, uh, in particular, uh, non-relativistic quantum field theories can fit into this picture. <laughs> um, so, um, just to get back to this diagram, uh, general relativity, for instance, right, is a theory in which uh, <coughs> gravity and uh, relativity are turned on, um, and quantum effects are turned off. Um, so the Q entails that there are three distinct approaches to constructing uh, a fully relativistic quantum theory of gravity. I quantize in general relativity, uh, turning on quantum effects, um, general relativity, uh, um, relative, uh, turning on gravity in the relativistic quantum field theory, or um, and the approach novel to Christian of relativizing um, Newtonian quantum gravity. Um, so, um, I'd now like to briefly consider the nature of, of the limits in this diagram. So first, the non-relativistic limit uh, might initially be thought of as a contraction of the Poincaré group to obtain the Galilei group. Um, an article by Bakri and W. Long um, explicitly demonstrates how this can be done. However, uh, as authors like Brown and Holland indicate, the exact nature of such a non-relativistic limit sometimes depends on the form of the dynamical equations of the relativistic theory, and not just its kinematical group theoretic structure. <coughs> um, and moreover, even at the kinematical level, identifying relativistic theories with the Poincaré group and non-relativistic theories with the Galilei group is problematic. Um, for instance, uh, the link between general relativity and Newtonian uh, Newton-Cartan gravity uh, uh, cannot be de uh, described in these terms. On the one hand, <coughs> the point gray group is not the symmetry group associated with general relativity. Um, most people identify uh, a group of uh, uh, morphisms on the manifold uh, as a symmetry group of general relativity. Um, and on the other hand, the version of Newtonian uh, Newton Cartan gravity that is the non relativistic limit of general relativity is weak. Cartan gravity, um, and this version does not have the Galilei group as its symmetry. Um, so there are problems with, uh, with fully articulating the, uh, the non relativistic um, I consider the, uh, the G goes to zero limit. Uh, so one problem here concerns the distinction between Ricci flatness and Riemann flatness. Um, so if turning off gravity and general relativity means setting the Newtonian gravitational constant to zero in the Einstein equation, uh, then the result is Ricci flat vacuum Einstein spacetime, and not Riemann flat um, Minkowski spacetime. 
which one would expect to be associated with special relativity. <coughs> Uh, and similarly, set in g to zero in the generalized Poisson equation of Newton-Cartan gravity or Newtonian quantum gravity uh, should result in a Ricci flat classical space-time and not Riemann flat neo-Newtonian space-time, uh, which one would expect to associate with uh, uh, Galilei invariant classical mechanics and Galilei invariant uh, quantum mechanics. Um, and now, uh, finally, uh, consider the uh, uh, the h bar goes to zero limit. And it potentially faces the problem of privilege associated with the quantization procedure. <clears throat> so, for a theory of a classical relativistic field with infinite degrees of freedom, uh, the failure of the Stone von Neumann theorem entails that there are uncountably many unitarily and equivalent representations of the canonical commutation relations of the corresponding quantum field theory. Um, now, uh, again, um, Inequivalent quantizations also arise for systems with topologically non-trivial state spaces, um, regardless of whether they're finite or infinite. Uh, but bar on these topological mutants, uh, the problem of privilege does not arise for either uh, Galilean variant quantum mechanics or for Newtonian quantum mechanics. Um, and now to the problem of where uh, non-relativistic quantum field theories fit in. So, in addition to these concerns over how explicit links in the monolith are to be fleshed out, there's a deeper uh, structural problem. Um, so, to make it explicit, consider the link between Newtonian quantum gravity and Galilean variant quantum mechanics. Um, Newtonian quantum gravity is a non-relativistic quantum field theory of gravity in a curved classical space-time. Uh, so, turning off gravity in such a theory should result in a non-relativistic quantum field theory in a Ricci flat classical space-time, and the scope of such a theory is larger than the scope of uh, GQM, uh, assuming the latter refers to finite Galilean variant quantum mechanics. Um, and moreover, uh, turning off relativity in a relativistic quantum field theory uh, should result in a non-relativistic quantum field theory. And again, the scope of, of non-relativistic quantum field theory in QFT in this context seems wider than the scope of uh, GQM. <clears throat> uh, Non-relativistic quantum field theories are infinite dimensional field theories, and they're invariant of the symmetries of a classical space-time, which need not be near a total space-time. So, naively, one way to fix uh, these links is to add another axis to the monolith that would represent degrees of freedom. One might let uh, NQM refer to uh, non-relativistic finite dimensional quantum theories of particle dynamics, whereby particle, I, uh, particle in this context just means a finite degrees of freedom. <clears throat> um, and one might consider uh, NQMs to be the n goes to zero limit of non-relativistic quantum field theories, where n is, is degrees of freedom. Um, so if we add this additional uh, axis, uh, then the monolith becomes a hypercube um, with axes that distinguish between particle and field theories uh, on the n-axis, relativistic versus non-relativistic theories, gravitational versus non-gravitational theories, and classical versus quantum theories. <coughs> um, and I, I'd now like to briefly consider how one might describe these, the links that involve turning off gravity in the field theory in this, in this hypercube. Um, oh, uh, so here, uh, in the diagram here, I'm, this is the hypercube, and I'm suppressing the g-axis. Uh, and, the, and the vertices here, let's see, represent uh, non-relativistic classical mechanics, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, relativistic classical mechanics, relativistic quantum mechanics, um, and we uh, let the number of degrees of freedom go to a very large uh, infinity. We get uh, non relativistic classical field theories, relativistic classical field theories, and there's our vertex that represents non relativistic quantum field theories. Um, and then we also have relativistic quantum field theories. <clears throat> so let me briefly consider how one might describe the links that involve turning off gravity in a field theory. 
Um, these links represent uh, result in the four types of theories that are highlighted here in red. <coughs> Um, so first, uh, a non-relativistic classical field theory should be the uh, g goes to zero limit of a non-relativistic classical field theory of gravity. Um, an example of such a theory is asymptotically spatially flat newton cartan gravity. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, one can argue that it is empirically equivalent to the version of Newtonian gravity in neo-Newtonian spacetime in which the gravitational potential is required to vanish at spatial infinity. Island universe neo Newtonian gravity. Um, when gravity is turned off in this latter theory, uh, one expects the result to be a Galilean variant classical field theory in, in neo Newtonian space time. In other words, an example of a, a non relativistic classical field theory. Um, now, relativistic classical field theory should be the G goes to zero limit of relativistic classical field theories of gravity. Um, and an example of the latter is general relativity. So turn it on gravity and general relativity assumably results in a relativistic classical field theory in a Ricci flat balance in space time. Um, and finally, uh, non-relativistic quantum field theory should be the G goes to zero limit of non-relativistic quantum field theories of gravity. Um, and an example of the latter is Newtonian quantum gravity. And its G goes to zero limit evidently should be a non-relativistic quantum field theory in a Ricci flat classical space time. <coughs> So, um, adding a fourth dimension, a fourth axis to Christian's monolith in this way, uh, finally uh, suggests that there should be a four ways of turning on fully relativistic quantum gravity. Right? Uh, by quantizing general relativity, uh, by turning on gravity in a relativistic quantum field theory, um, by relativizing <coughs> Newtonian quantum gravity, um, or by taking <coughs> some sort of thermodynamic limit of a relativistic uh, quantum particle theory of gravity could be the fourth way. Um, now, what a relativistic quantum particle theory of gravity would amount to is anyone's guess. So um, that's all I'm going to talk about. Thank you. 
I mean, I think you think it takes that possible. Yeah. 
naively you'd want to, I mean, if your theory is supposed to be described in particles, then there should be a fact of the matter how many particles there are. Um, if I might add a comment on that, uh, the, the working physicist who believes in uh, sorry, quantons, I think I'll not use the P word for my comments, um, the working physicist who describes the, these things never uses the particle number, number here, uh, either local or global, except in the asymptotic realm, where for all practical purposes all interactions have disappeared. Now they still want to keep track of the constituents of the system being observed. And what do they use? They use things like total electric charge, total lepton number, total baryon number, isotopic spin, strangeness, quantities which to one degree or another are conserved dynamically and can be used indirectly to infer uh, numbers of constituents. But you never pay attention to the number of constituents while the interactions are going on because that number, aside from the fact that it's changing wildly, it's even wildly undefined as statistical indefiniteness, quantum mechanical statistical indefiniteness. So th this is not a criticism of your approach idiosyncratically because I know that this, this approach, this focus on number operators is sort of pandemic in the, in the literature. But it, it does strike me as rather distant from the practice that is employed by physicists who use quantum So I'm trying to understand um, what the g goes to zero limit means. I mean, if I just think of um, g as the thing that multiplies the stress energy in Einstein's equation, then yeah, you just get Ricci flat. But if I think of you know one over sixteen pi g as the thing that multiplies the scalar curvature in the action which goes into the path integral, then I could imagine very different consequences for thinking of g goes to zero limit. So is there um, is, is there a nice sort of simple story about you know what the g goes to zero limit means and, and why it, it means in a particular way? Um, yeah, I not not that I'm, I'm aware of. You know, I, I, I just I I'm not sure how how to uh, formulate that. Um, what it means to turn off gravity. Well, um, that I mean that's sort of one of the questions I. But, but, but on your cube, you, you have you know, things like, okay, you take these theories, and then you take you goes to zero, and you get these theories. So that, that, that's, that's well understood? Or that's no, I, I don't know. know. It's Christian's cube. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so going back to the very first part of the talk about the about <laughs> um, Did I get the logic of this right? So people say, you know, if particle, then sort of x, a, a and b were the conditions. And you're sort of, and then they say not x, and then sort of conclude not particles. And you're criticizing that by saying we could infer instead that the conditional is wrong, that x isn't a necessary condition for particles. Is that, is that the logic of it? Yeah, I think so. I'm calling into in, in question the, the, the necessary conditions. So we suddenly have, okay. So how are we going to settle that issue? I guess I didn't quite get how we're supposed to settle that issue, whether it's right to keep the conditional and throw them off particles or reject the conditional. Um, yeah. Because in a certain sense, the results you're talking about are just more risks of the mill of showing them off particles, right, if you hold on to the condition. Yeah, I guess that's one way you can interpret it. I mean, I, I guess so I guess what I was waiting for in the rest of the talk was some other kind of characterization of particles that you found in the in the in the Italian yeah, analysis. Totally say, but look, we get this in the quantum case, and so that's a good reason to reject the, the necessary condition. Yeah, I'm not offering a, not an alternative. So yeah, so the, the, the your reason for criticizing them as necessary conditions is because they rely on uh, sort of classical intuitions and the temporal structure. Right? 
but then so, so you're whatever proposing kind of for a different condition would potentially not have that. Do you, do you have any, is this something you have ideas about that just weren't part of the talk or just? Um, nothing, nothing worked out. Okay. Yeah, I mean, but that doesn't seem like a criticism of the condition. It just seems to show why the condition fails and why you don't have thought of it. Um, it would be very wise, essentially, I think, and, and I would argue that the, the founders of quantum mechanics, uh, uh, Kopenhagen School, was initially trying something very much like that, not necessarily restricted to these constituents, but the idea is to stay close to experimental observation and practice and, and, and detection. Now, my guess would be that that by itself would not be adequate to mount the genuine conceptual apparatus for what I choose to call quantons. But that would be the place to start, and you would never want to lose that connection in the process of elaborating the conceptual apparatus. I, I think that's exactly the way one has to go. Any I think it would be a mistake to think about where particles are going to turn up in our theory to suppose that somehow there's a dichotomy between having them turn up at some some level, say fundamental, which would be past the QFT is fundamentally a particle theory on the one hand, and understanding them purely in instrumentalistic terms on the other hand. I mean, and again, apologies for going on about this. Um, this, this the, the intermediate space where one has just has something at an emergent or approximate level, but still takes it seriously, it will be all over the place. I mean, in a place where it's um, I think it's pretty unproblematic to going on is the particles in the impact physics. Um, I mean, something like a phone bill. I mean, nobody thinks um, that a, a crystal is actually, is actually a phone bill or something. Um, uh, but equally, it doesn't seem helpful to cash out a phone on in purely instrumentalistic detection terms. Phonons are Immersion <coughs> inside the crystal, which are manifested in certain ways and functions. Um, and I mean, actually, the only interesting thing of what's going on here is why is it that um, what, why is it that in the relativistic quantum mechanics we have a, um, a possibility of formulating theories where that's not the story to tell about particles, where the particles all went down, 
uh, were in our domestic conflict patterns and indeed in some of nature settings. That doesn't seem to be the story at the time. Um, and in past we see to be that this is very part of it in terms of the fact that the number of vacuum doesn't seem to have been angled, whereas the relativity vacuum we know is very heavily angled and the uh, and the solid state vacuum, so to speak, is also very heavily angled.